Okay, welcome to another episode of the Millennial Entrepreneur Podcast. I'm starting my own business while studying university and gaining funding from O2. I love following the journeys of other young entrepreneurs. In the conversation today, I spoke to Lydia Jones, the founder of Housemates, a platform that streamlines the whole process of booking student accommodation for both landlords and students. Having dropped out of school at the age of 15 to recently securing £100,000 in funding for her startup at only just 21 years old, we talk about the process behind this, along with other lessons she has learned on her serial entrepreneurial journey, starting from selling turkeys in Manchester at the age of 12. I hope you enjoyed the episode. It really was one of my favourites to record, and I hope it's one of your favourites too. If you do enjoy, please be sure to leave a review and a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Um, and follow us on our new Instagram page. The link's in the description. So yeah, let's get on with the episode. Hey Lydia, how are you? Hey, I'm all right. How are you? Yeah, very good, thanks. Um, I'm yeah, massively excited to have you on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be on your show. I, like, I think for this episode, we're probably going to run out of time because we have so many things that I'd love to talk about. There's just so many things. So why don't we kind of just start with how you got involved in, in entrepreneurialism? Because you, you dropped out of school at, at 15, didn't you? So yeah, how did that all kind of, how did that whole process work? Yeah, so for me, um, it started a little bit earlier than 15 in terms of like entrepreneurial activity. So um, it's going to sound mad, um, but everyone in Manchester, like when, when they see me, they know me as Lydia with the turkeys because uh, when I was like 12 years old, I had like so many turkeys and I was like breeding and selling turkeys and chickens and ducks and all these different <laughs> things. So really? there's always... Yeah, there's, there's always been something in me. Like when I was in school, um, I was always friends with the boys. So I always made sure that like with football cards, I always got the best deal. Um, so there's just been something naturally competitive in me. But in terms of school, to talk around that circumstance, like school was miserable for me in the sense of primary school was amazing. Um, my friends were all boys. I went to high school and girls just made my life considerably hard because um, I was always a little bit more boisterous and a tomboy. And it went on for a few years, and it was just very, very miserable in school. I was isolated quite a lot. And when I was in school, I was hugely frustrated with, um, like, I come from a family where they all own their own businesses um, who haven't gone to university, haven't gone that route to say that I have a student-facing company, weirdly enough. Um, yeah, but. Yeah. The, the irony um but I think for I think for me I, I was I was just frustrated in school I was I was unhappy in school and um I wasn't like a grade a straight student um and I, I'm, I can I can say that proudly because I'm great at other things um and I think when it got to when I was around 15 I was just that miserable that my parents said well let, let's just let's just take you out of that circumstance so I dropped out of school um, I was homeschooled in total for about 15 hours a week. And I'd done my GCSEs as a external student um, in like local schools and colleges. So that meant that like, instead of like having all those hours in school and that I used to have, I had so much more time because I, I just wanted to pass these GCSEs, right? I didn't really know where my life was going. It sounds quite, quite weird looking back, yeah. but I was training a lot in the gym. So I have a shed at the bottom of my garden. It's converted into a gym. It's like my safe haven. And um, I was training a lot and that was my release to kind of get through that period of time. Because as I say, I didn't know what was next. And I came up with the idea of Fit Flash like one day when I was in the gym, which was, I was hugely frustrated that I wanted to meet more people like myself who were young and addicted and probably should have been lifting weights at that that age. Um, but, you know, that was what I wanted to do. So Fifth Flash came out of that. So I dropped out of school around the October time, like mid-October. And by the November, um, I came up with the idea and I was like, what I, I didn't know I was doing, I was prototyping, but I didn't know I was prototyping, if that makes sense. Like, I didn't know it was called okay. prototyping. I was drawing this thing and I thought, okay, I want to build this thing, which was a mobile app. Um, but later I discovered it was called prototyping because that's how new I was to tech. Um, but yeah, that's how kind of like, it's a little bit of background on, on my journey and how I ended up leaving school. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. 
but it must have been it must have been a very sort of i'm just putting myself in your position of uh well i mean i did something similar where i sold i sold like sweets in school but i never sold turkeys but <laughs> but even still it wouldn't give me the sort of confidence to start my own thing straight out of school so it's really amazing to hear that you did that and especially in such a short space of time i mean you dropped out in like october started fish uh, fit flash in november and that was at the age of like 15 wasn't it yeah you know i think there's something there though because um my mom shows me like um like year seven work so in year seven you're like 11 right and they asked me in school uh, in the same school that i dropped out of like who are your role models and like we've still got it to this day and it it has all the photos and all the names and their backgrounds and on this has like bernie eccleston founder of f1 uh richard branson james khan who used to be on the dragons then hillary devey karen brady yeah. Uh, from The Apprentice, the, I, I was like 11 and I was like fascinated with people building businesses. So I was like reading those books when I was 11, um, just fascinated with how people could take something from nothing to be in like a national or global company. So I think there's just something there where um, as a person, uh, and I, I try and get my team to adopt this as much as possible. Now, um, I'm quite like, high risk in the sense of like, you know, you know, you could say to me, well, this is going to be very high risk. Don't do that. It makes me want to do it more. And um, so the, the fact of starting a business so quickly at the time, it didn't really feel like a business with Fifth Flash because I wasn't really sure how I was going to monetize it. I just knew that it had to be built because I wanted that solution. And, um, you know, I had a problem and I wanted to build the solution. It was more because you just wanted to build something, it sounds like. I think so, yeah. So what, what actually was FitFlash? So FitFlash was, it started out like a, a small social network. Um, and it was the same time when Instagram was just starting to really take off in terms of like moving away from being just photography based. People were taking selfies. It was that movement. So this was 2014 the hashtags like fitness on Instagram were only just starting. Um, so we were a fitness only social network, um, which sounds crazy because when someone says to me now that they're building a social network, I say, don't attempt it <laughs> because it's such a competitive market. Um, but yeah, we were social yeah, network yeah. We, and we, we had, um, we had tracking elements to it from a fitness standpoint as well. So you could track your goals, you could share them, you could track all your measurements. Um, but yeah, it's very soon after that, the other players came into the space who dominated and, and, and quite frankly, provided a better solution. Just because of time, I just want to move on from, from Fit, Fit Flash. So how would that kind of journey finish uh, from Fit Flash? Because you must have learned a lot of stuff from that. What was the sort of next stage? I think from Fit Flash finished because competitors came in, they raised money before us and they failed before us. So I was quite certain on not raising money and blowing investors' money and kind of, I don't know, sabotaging my reputation. I just didn't want to do that. I, I can only take money personally and my own values if I can return it. That's how I view it now. So I, I, I yeah. worked on Fifth Flash for two years and I seen our competitors fail. And I thought at the time I had another idea behind the scenes and I thought, well, there's no ego in, in calling this a day. You know, I've learned what I've, I've needed to learn. I took it to over 20,000 users. Um, I grew a brand ambassador team uh, and I grew all the social medias. I learned so much that um, it was just my taste of tech, really, that just just led me to where I am now. Okay, yeah. So what was what was the sort of next stage? So and then you started an, uh, a platform called Troops, right? Yeah, so um, Troops basically sounds a bit crazy, but... When I was trying to get Fit Flash to like to get seen more on Instagram at the time, we it was that period of time where you would like paste like twenty hashtags on your posts to try and get it seen with Instagram's algorithm. How they are very different now. Um, and basically, one day I was I was like figuring out like why why where is the future of hashtags? Like, um, how do I see this movement going? What is someone's social DNA? You've got to have a social DNA online. What is your online DNA? And then I worked yeah. on a platform called Troops, which was 
it would you would sign up and you would give it some information and it would learn over time a little bit like ai in a way but i hate that buzzword. <laughs> it's, it's very um, overused it's and very it would overused. only show you <laughs> oh ai blockchain any of those machine learning like they just love the, those terms um and basically uh, this troops would go out and it would only show your content to those it was relevant to and you could boost content and it would go out to like 10x um, of the same demographic. So it was very, very niche and it was a very complex algorithm. I worked on it with a previous co-founder and the big lesson that I learned was um, don't spend so much time on an algorithm and get something out the door a lot quicker. Um and, you know, by the time that we launched the algorithm and launched the platform in beta, Instagram launched its hashtag algorithm, a dedicated algorithm to do the exact same thing. Um, and that was basically like 18 months of our lives. Um, mine and Danny, a previous co-founder of what we felt like had just gone down the drain. How did that, how did um, that but feel? But we learned a huge... Sorry to cut you off. How did that feel? It felt really... Yeah felt really bad. You know, we were over in Boston at the time on a, on like a scholarship, um, having this experience, meeting different mentors. And then we, one of our mentors at the time, who was based in Silicon Valley that we'd have like Zoom calls with, you know, he, um, he messaged us and said, have you, have you seen the news? And I said, oh, why is it? And he said, um, oh, Instagram is launching a hashtag algorithm in about a one month's time. It's covered on TechCrunch. And I remember just sitting there um, and not quite understanding how I was going to tell people because so many people had had known that me and Danny were working on it um, and how, what I was going to do, what we were going to do. So the flight back from Boston to New York and then New York back home, it was very silent because both of us just didn't really know what was to come next. Um, But yeah, it was, it was a tough time. You learn these lessons, you know, tech is, an extremely competitive market. Everyone wants to build the next thing. And ultimately, um, as I'll explain later on, like in a podcast or whatever, you know, there's category kings as they call them. Facebook is a category king in the sense that, um, you know, it takes 70% of its market share, like Google, like Uber, like others. Yeah. And when they do that, you know, they're a, they're a monopoly. So anything, that can potentially be an advance to their product. They're acquiring companies left and right and cent- left, right and center, and they're innovating at a speed um, because they've got the resource. So yeah, I learned a very, very valuable lesson, which was um, kind of build quick and ship it fast and get your feedback, which is now drilled into housemates. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a very fundamental lesson that I guess you learned very early on not in the best circumstances, but I guess you're very thankful now that it did happen. Yeah, 100%. So let's move on to, to Housemates. So obviously with all of that, what Instagram did, it felt very natural to leave troops. What did you think in that moment, what did you think was going to be next in your in your journey? Because I guess it was similar to when you dropped out of school at 15, you were very uncertain what, what was going to happen uh, because you knew Instagram was coming out with this. So yeah, what was going through your mind at that point? You know, it was a... It was like a a sore point in my journey because I had spent so much time and family had just seen me and Danny kind of working all these hours and like late night coding sessions and that like real co-founder bond. And at the same time, he had a girlfriend who was going to university who was in her first year. And I had a family member who was going to university in her first year. And both of us never took the university route. Like we were just... I don't know, we would have felt constrained and suffocated based on my personal experiences in school. Um, so basically, uh, we went to visit family. We, we got off the plane, having landed back in Manchester from Boston. And we went, you know, we said to each other, let's not speak to each other for a few days. Let's just let's go and just refresh our minds and, and, and see what we're going to do. And I went and visited my family member in uh, Liverpool University, and he went and visited his girlfriend up in uh, like a Ormskirk University outside Liverpool. Okay. And you know, when he was staying there, you know, we stayed over the night at our, at our family members' places. And I was just like, you know, these were new students thrown into accommodation. And, you know, I was asking people like, aren't you going to go and like knock next door and find out who your neighbor is? Um, and they were like, oh, I don't really know how to do that. And I'm a bit shy or... 
And I, we started digging into this problem. You know, Danny was seeing the same problem yeah. in the halls of residence on, on the campus that for his girlfriend. And Hall Hang was born. And Hall Hang was kind of this social network again. Um, didn't learn my lesson from uh, <laughs> fifth, fifth Lash yeah. and social networks. But you know, it was a geolocation social network. So it would show you um, complying with GDPR, I have to say, who lived in your building. Um, and it would allow you to kind of host parties. And it was very, it was a very fun product. It was an iOS app. Um, and we had quite a lot of usage on it. And the more it went on, you know, it got more international students using it. And then life really changed. Like Danny decided he didn't want to be a part of a startup anymore, which is fair enough. He went his own way and I had whole hang by myself. Um, and yeah, I, I, I got, I got offered a job down London way as a product manager and whole hang was running alongside that job. And for six months, all I got was feedback about how hard it is to book student accommodation from these, all these 60 countries that would allow the app to be available and to download. Um, and they were like venting on there about like, why is it so expensive? Why does it take so much time? How did you, and that's what sorry, led to how, how did you, you know? find out about, um, was it just on the, on the forums and messages and stuff? Yeah. So like what would happen is we, we had that like network effect. So oh, okay. we opened it up on 60 different app stores like languages wise, country and territory wise. So they could download it. Cause sometimes like when people come to the UK as a student, they will still stay on like uh, the Australian app store, say on their phone and they just don't change it. You can manually change it, but they don't uh, usually. So we made sure that was on all these um, app stores. So all students could use it. So the UK students, cause we started off in Liverpool, they were using it and then they were telling their friends back home about it. So they, there was this like, frustration because their friends back home hadn't yet got a place yet but they would land on a public forum um and all they would vent about is how hard it is to get the police in the first place um so you know it was kind of like the step before hall hang which is actually getting the accommodation was the hardest part it turns out um and that's where housemates came from i had six months thousands of requests whilst i was in my job my day job um, and I just decided to quit and, and go all in and make and make it. That's really interesting, because you didn't actually go. You, you didn't actually go to university. You didn't actually experience that struggle. Um, I did, and there is a struggle with finding a house, definitely. But it's interesting that you never actually went through that. But you saw that people were struggling with it. It wasn't a personal thing. So housemates right now, as it stands, is very different to what it was a year ago. We are an end-to-end service for booking student accommodation. Um, you know, we provide that. We're now launching our web app. Um, we've got more investors who uh, are interested in the company and we'll be doing a seed round, probably Q1 2021. I think there's an amazing opportunity for housemates to become the leader, which hasn't existed yet in this space. Um, you know, I think there's an opportunity to build a brand that is student first. Um, and I think... You know, we're really attracting the right talent. You know, employees are referring to other employees, whether it's on internships or whatever. Um, you know, I just want it to be, we say that we want to be that mate-like service. Um, and, you know, we, we're constantly being cheeky in how we put that across as our brand. But we also want to be a place where people like work. And that is my mission as a founder. You know, I really want to create a company that I would want to work for and I would want to recommend people to. Um but I just, I just think, you know, we're only just getting started. Yes, there's been a year and a half nearly behind the scenes of unbelievable amounts of groundwork and meeting lots of different mentors and, and so many things. But there's been so many valuable lessons learned. Um, and I feel like we now have the right investors, the right talent, um, the right product and solution. Um, and we're really, really investing into community. We've got large Facebook groups. We've got forums. Um, you know, the student, the feedback loops that we're building with the end consumer, I haven't seen any brand doing it in our space. And I really think that's the recipe for success for us going forward. How, how have you built those feedback loops? Oh, I think for us, you know, the tone of voice that we use as a brand is very, very, very relatable. Yeah. It, is, it is coming from the students. 
um, you know, with being quite honest about it, like we want, you know, our mission is to simplify Brooklyn student accommodation and to take the headache out of that. So we've literally went to market across Facebook and, and platforms saying, um, come help us build the best solution yet. And, you know, that's how simple it is. But when, you know, consumers feel like they're being listened to and they can resonate and feel that pain point, they really want to help you build the best solution. And that's what we're witnessing now. Um, it's quite unbelievable to see how how much even they're having a say in product design and everything behind the scenes. It's, it's fantastic. I could have definitely done with a product like Housemates when I was looking for a property for my, my second and third year at university because there is, especially in Bristol, there is like a massive sort of, because the thing that house, uh, Housemates does so well is that it goes direct to the landlords, doesn't it? Yeah. So there's, a, there's so many agencies. There's, there's like a few agencies in Bristol. So they have a, a very much like localized monopoly and they treat students really badly, basically. And yeah, so building a solution based solely and bespoke kind of on that student experience, I think is definitely needed. De- definitely, you know, um it's just allowing two parties to transact without the, the, the time cost and the, the, the cost, the financial cost. Um, and you just, I don't think you need another person. You know, it's just like having a conversation. That's how simple it should be. What was going through your mind when you decided to leave your job to work on this full time? So <laughs> as, a, as a person, you know, um, we were talking before this podcast and I said to you, you know, I love risk. Um, it's yeah. it's quite dangerous in a way, but what happened to me is I was I was telling people like this is the data I've got. I was working away, so one week I would be remote, the next I would be down London way where the company was that I was working for, and I'd be like staying in like Airbnbs and like hostel those type of things when I was working away, and I'd be like up early hours in the morning hearing all these people vent about how hard it is. And I started looking at the market and that's it. You know, I said, I said to family, I'm going to quit. And before they had a chance to tell me, no, I'd sent the email and I just quit. Um, and that, that, that was it. That was it. So they, they had, they had absolutely no chance of persuading you whatsoever. No, you know, I, I was just, I was going to figure it out. I think that that's something that I say to everyone, like you will figure it out. Like, especially in uncertain times, like now when people um, who have, may have been made redundant or furloughed or such uncertain times people will figure out how to get through this time and i just figured out that somehow it would all make sense and and fall together when you decided to do this was it because this is an industry that has had pretty little innovation if you think about it compared to other industries was this a red flag for you or is it kind of like hang on there's no innovation here there's so much room for us to exploit uh so the second one so for me um, you know, there's just take, t- just take to kind of give a figure. So your know, student accommodation every year globally, there's 180 billion spent on student accommodation. And that's just one part of the student journey. You know, at Housemates long term, our mission is to, is to be more of a student lifestyle brand to encompass all parts of that student journey into transitioning into a young professional. Um, but I think you know, there's there's so much room for innovation and disruption as much as I, that word is overused. I just think our competitors that are out there that are doing kind of 130 million a year in revenue, um, you know, they're consultancy based still. And, you know, many people ask me why. And it's because like, well, they're doing 130 million in revenue. They're comfortable. Um, you know, they were founded on that. They weren't founded by tech founders. They were founded by business people, um, and which is great. But you know, I believe tech can can create a better solution. Is to me, I'm a product person, um, and I think with the rise of Airbnb and um, on demand services, there's just no reason why a student shouldn't be able to book a property um, as easy as it is to buy a piece of clothing online. And that is really what we're aiming for. Yeah, definitely. Do you think that's the biggest sort of reason? I know it's a bit of a side question, but I'd be interested to hear. Do you think that's the biggest sort of reason why these big companies sitting on like massive stockpiles of cash don't innovate in these sort of sectors? Because as you say, they are comfortable. Yeah. I mean, like, um, there's so much proof around it. You know, there's, there's a lot of reports on this, but I, 
I can say from my own experience, you know, my competitors, I do a lot of digging around competitors because you want to know what are they great at and where, where are the weaknesses, right? So a lot of us yeah, of course, yeah. are extremely localized within international Chinese market. Um, but at the same time, you ask any UK students who they are and they say, who is that? And, you know, one of the key things that we've seen right across the board from reading thousands of customer reviews, um, from interviewing hundreds of students in person, online, etc., is that all our competitors have made the student feel and say to us as a brand that they haven't put the student first. And that is the main thing of um, in our values at Housemates is that we are a student first brand because without the students, there's no property owners that no property owners can rent to the students. So even though supply is king in a marketplace, the student is the start is the start of the student's economy. And that is the one valuable lesson that we're watching all our competitors in this current global crisis of COVID-19 really, really feel the brutality of because they still haven't shown empathy to students in this situation. Um, and I just think that, you know, those values, values are uh, very important. And we're now living in a digital age where, um, you know, consumers really, really look at the missions of companies and the values and the purpose. And yeah, I, I just, definitely. I, I mean, you walk down the high street and Lush and all these brands and um, you've got more people now being vegan, you know, we're shifting completely. The consumers are shifting. Um, and I just feel like you're right. A lot of these companies have sat on good amounts of cash. They aren't even acquiring companies. You know, that would be something that I would be doing if I was them. Um, if you didn't want to internally innovate, but I just see it as a huge opportunity, I think. So you, you, you expanded it and you got all the, uh, you got, you got more users onto the platform. Did you, when did you start to decide to go out and raise funding? Um, so my journey was, so I had a little bit of savings when I quit my job. Um, and then, uh, my brother, he has a construction business. He gave us, uh, which was like £10,000 on their SCIS, so tax relief. Um, so that got us over a few months. And then I, you know, I knew I was working with an ex-venture capital as a mentor to build a business plan and financial forecast because I knew no one would give me money without those. And I also was very aware that there was many red flags that I didn't understand about my market that I personally felt like I needed to understand before I asked anyone for their money. Um, so that whole discovery and, and exploration process um, of primary and secondary research and building the business plan, that helped me. So that I was doing that alongside. So by that time, you know, August last year, I applied for an accelerator called Ignite, which, is, which was the first angel investor founded um, accelerator in the UK, some great companies have come out of it. I applied and uh, we, well, I got into that cohort. I relocated up to Newcastle for three months from September to December last year. And with that, we got £15,000 on a convertible note basis from North Star Venture Capital, um, which are a Northeast Venture Capital Fund. Um, and that kind of got us a little bit more runway. So I I mean, through the F Factor competition and, and how we have became aware of each other last year, which was June 2019, I got invited after that to pitch to some venture capitals and I went for the experience, but I knew I was nowhere near venture capital stage. Um, there was a lot of validation that still needed to be done, but I learned a lot in those kind of two hour interviews, which were quite intense. So I actually didn't start the fundraising process until October. And now this is going to make it sound that easy to everyone, but like it really wasn't this easy. I done one pitch event and that pitch event was my angel who backed me, um, Dave. And <laughs> she, 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 literally, literally my guardian it's never, angel. It's never that easy. No, it's never that easy ever. <laughs> you know, it makes it sound like that, but I have to say, you know, someone asked me recently, like, oh, what, I mean, it's very similar to you are, what was the journey like? And I was like, well, quite frankly, a week before I pitched, um, my mum rang me and I'm, I'm working away. Like 
and like living in this easy hotel, like this 15 pound a night hotel in Newcastle. And she rang me and she was like, so that you, so how much runway have you got? And I said, well, we've got till December. And she said, how far into December? I said, well, literally the end of December. She said, well, okay, well, if you, if that's it, you best start looking for a job in January then. And I, yeah, you know, it really, really hit me that I'd quit my job to make this happen. So I, I quite frankly, I had almost like this mental breakdown in this hotel room where I was thinking, should I just go and get a big load of credit cards? Cause I have, I had a good credit score and like fund this thing, like Airbnb founders funded this and just switch from credit card to credit card to buy me runway. Um, and then I, I went down, well, down from Newcastle to Manchester and I pitched, um, but it wasn't until like three or four weeks after that, that I actually found out that they were going to back me. Uh, there was some, there was some um, time between where I was. I wasn't thinking I was getting anything. If you didn't get that funding, would you have gone through with the credit card idea? Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. That's really interesting to hear because I know I know the Airbnb founders did it, but it's. I mean, as you kind of say, you do like risk, and that is probably the riskiest move that you could do because it would land you in a lot of debt. Yeah, you know, um, my take on this is that obviously. Um, debt can always be cleared, right? If you're smart about it. Yeah. Um, it's also figuring out what credit cards have the best interest, etc. Um, but at that point, you know, I was just so determined that I wasn't going to lose the company. Um, as I say now, it's only just getting started now. Um, and it wasn't coming from a place of ego. It was genuinely coming from a place of, I know I can do this better than the competition. And I would really beat myself up if I um, didn't take that credit card debt out, for example. You know, what could those extra three or four months or five months have bought us? Um, but yeah, thankfully, we we got the yes on the funding, which was great. How important was that business plan that you wrote when, that you wrote out for the for the investment? Um, so, like to explain how the investment pitch went, like five investors came up afterwards. And the very last one uh, was Dave, who was our angel investor. And he quite frankly, like he kept on allowing everyone to go in front of him. And I was wondering why this guy was doing this. Um, but, you know, he was just like waiting because you get a lot of ego at these at these events, like a lot of people who actually don't have money or aren't an angel investor, but just want to waste your time, which is probably one of the biggest things that I've seen happening to founders, like wasting their time with people instead of being direct and saying, can you write a check? Yeah, I guess what you kind of see with a lot of founders now is that the business plan is kind of neglected a lot of times, but you're quite a big advocate. I mean, not advocate, but you think the the business plan is still a really important uh, thing to have. Yeah, I can see me writing one of these books, like why startup founders need a business plan still in 2020. Um, Because, you know, since raising this money, quite a lot of young founders who probably your target audience um, for this podcast have reached out on LinkedIn and they're either saying, well, I'm planning to raise funding or I'm raising funding. Um, and I'm like, okay, so what's your data room like? And the first thing is like, what's the data room? And I said, so you, I realized there was a, there's a miss, you know, there's a piece of education there of people need a data room. They need a place like a Google drive doc. When an investor says to you, can you give me access to your data room? It's, Give me access to your business plan, your pitch deck, your financial forecasts, and anything else great that you've got to show me um, that you think is going to make me invest in you, right? So these founders are like, oh, what's a data room? And then when I started talking about the documents that were meant to be in a data room, I just genuinely felt this, um, this resistance when I said the word business plan to people, whether it was on the phone or on LinkedIn messages of like, oh, do we still need that? type of resistance. And I think this is because previously business plans were like 200 page documents that once you write them, they sit on the shelf and you never go back to them. And then over the last kind of 10 years with the lean startup movement and and lean and, and sprint and agile of getting something out there fast, which I'm a huge advocate of based on my experience with troops and my lessons learned. I just think that what tends to happen is they, they go out and they build something and they might not have even found product market fit yet, but they go out chasing the money for survival. 
um, which is fine in some cases, but the truth is an angel investor um, or a venture capital fund or a council fund or even a government grant, the first thing, or even if you go to a bank for a loan, it's always been that way. The first thing they ask for is a business plan. And I realized it was an educational piece because a business plan doesn't have to be 200 pages. It can be 10 pages of high level. Um, it can be very, very simple. You can literally pull the slides out of your pitch deck. So what is the problem? What is our solution? What is the team? What's the competitive advantage? What are the pros and cons to our competitors, etc.? You can literally pull that out of your 10 to 12 slide investor presentation and make a business plan off that. Um, and it should really be a, the way I see it is it should be a document that, um, you know, you can update once a year, maybe not like a product roadmap as often as that, but in difficult situations, you can go back and almost use it as a, as a mental model to make a decision. You know, I'm not saying that a business plan can prep you for a COVID-19 because I don't think anyone could have prepped for that one. Um, but I, yeah. I certainly think it can help you navigate, navigate like, for example, should we partner with this brand? Well, does that brand have the same values as us? You know, those types of situations, which can be very effective and sometimes, you know, can do a lot to the reputation of your startup on who you partner with. If you have a great business plan and a great strategy, um, then yeah, you know, it can get you to another place. How important is that, the the data room that you just, that you just mentioned? Because I guess that's something that is very, I mean, I didn't know, I didn't know what that was actually, to be honest with you. Um, yeah. So yeah, why don't you just explain a bit about what that is? So a data room, um, they call it a data room because it's got some information in it. And like the way they imagine it is you're unlocking a door and look and allowing them to see your amazing opportunity. I think it, it came from America, if I'm honest, but they, they use the terminology across the UK now. Um, you know, the, the first thing they say is if you've sent someone, um, if, if you've sent someone a pitch deck and you've a fund and you've gone in to pitch to them or even an investor um, and, you know, you've had that great conversation and they want to see a little bit more, maybe before they do further due diligence on you and your startup and market, they say, give us access to your data room. And that can be a Google Drive folder. It can be just a folder that you share on an email with a password. But inside that folder, you should have subfolders that basically one for your business plan, one for your financial forecasts, one for your pitch deck, and one for anything else. Maybe it's like videos, demos of the product, testimonials, etc. cetera. Um, and the concept of it is, is it's a central place that you as a founder, I update mine um, as and when I have something to update in it. You know, it's a continuous all those documents should be up to date, especially if you're planning to raise further rounds of investment. Um, but it allows you to track progress as well. But it's essentially a place that allows them to really, really see with clarity the opportunity. Um, and especially with funds, you know, they are partners and analysts of funds. So if you give access to your data room with your financial model, they're going to test that financial model. They're going to throw it through a few different algorithms. Um, there's quite a lot that happens between, um, hi, I'm Lydia and I'm housemates and then getting the money in the bank, whether it's from a VC or an angel. Um, there's always some kind of, of, of testing on that data room. Okay, so it's basically like a portfolio that you continuously update with your com company information, basically showcasing why an investor should invest in you. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, it seems like something that every company should have yeah right i mean it's it's so valuable another thing that should be in there is your product roadmap but that should sync with your financials with obviously your budgeting because if you've got a product roadmap and you know you need six devs in q121 then you need to, to budget for that right but i think it it allows anyone to see you know i'm not saying give all your employees access to your data room it really depends on how tra transparent that you want to be but you can, you can allow certain things to be accessed across your company, right? So with us, everyone sees the product roadmap, everyone sees the business plan, everyone sees the pitch deck, our designers create our, our board decks, um, you know, that, that's total transparency. And it allows everyone to buy into that mission because you need people to be aligned to deliver and to want to deliver as, as best as they can. Okay, so you raised 100K 
from was it an angel investor or a vc it was an angel uh, right? i raised 100k from an angel and a fund but it wasn't a vc fund it was uh, more of a okay uh, a local fund a regional fund yeah so all the biggest sort of challenges in raising that money so you know other founders who i'm friends with who kind of a few steps ahead or at the same place have told me that you know once you get the yes it's only just begun and i, I really realized that because um you know, I got the yes, and the, the, I got the yes in, um, it was, I think it was the start of November, 2019, um, well, start on mid of November, and the money didn't clear and hit the bank until um, the 29th of February this year, leap year. So, um, you know, it was a good few months. In between that, I was out in Melbourne, um, you know, I, my the, the the biggest thing was is investors said we're going to back you and then i had to sit my investors down and say well or soon to be investors i've got all this data on the other side of the world in australia of where people are trying to use our service can i go and basically that could have potentially been the life and death of that 100k investment but i was fortunate that they said i'm gonna, we're going to back you anyway um but that meant that um literally february the month the deal was closing I was out in Melbourne with back-to-back -back meetings, meeting supply and students, etc. So it was an incredibly tough time, but I learned that, you know, the, you've got to get the legals right. You also, it buys you some time to build that relationship. It's incredibly important to get your relationship right with your investors. You almost don't want them to feel like an investor. You want them to feel like a mentor, which I'm now fortunate to have that with, 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 with my investors. Um, where you can call them and you can tell them whether it's good or bad, because ultimately they should have the best interests of you and the company um, in their hearts, really. So I think getting your terms right, I see so many founders who, um, you wanna make sure those terms are fair for everyone. So you don't wanna have all the power. You don't want them to have all the power. Um, you know, you just wanna make sure they're right. I see so many founders who um, have either been kicked out of their own companies or just not known what they've signed. Yeah. Because let's face it, when someone says we're going to give you a hundred k or a million or ten million, like the sums that we see now, um, you can be you can be yeah. um like starry eyed from that. But I think it's really just saying, okay, great, you're giving me the money, but now what? You know, you, you've got to be prepared. You've got to yeah. be vigilant. Because you were telling me some really like harrowing stories of founders that wouldn't read these legal agreements and they wouldn't really think about it a few years down the line it all goes it all goes wrong for them yeah that's the thing you know at the start i mean this happens in all business right you know and it happens in all relationships yeah, it happens in, in in marriages you know it starts great but for whatever reason it can go bad you know whether it's co-founder fallout whether it's um, an investor wants to sell his stock, whatever it is, right? Things can go bad. And, you know, what you want to do is you almost want to, when you're going through those legals and those terms, you want to reverse engineer um, the whatever end point you've got in your head, however far you can go in your head and things that might potentially happen. How, how secure do you want to be? And most importantly, how secure do you want to make your other people feel? Because it's a two-sided it's two -sided way, right? So, um, you know, I, I think you have to, you really have to take into consideration things that could go wrong, which let's face it, you don't really want to be thinking about when it feels so positive that people are giving you money, but you want to build, just like they say, build a product so it's scalable. You want to build terms so that one of the biggest things is that all the future investors, which they do every single time, if you, if you're an investor, and I pitch to you next week and you say you want to back me. Um, and I say, okay, great. And they say, okay, give me access to your data room and your existing legal documents. And if they look at those terms and don't think they're fair, well, you can actually end up scaring other investors off long term. So you want to make sure that your terms and your legals are fair even to new investors joining at different stages in the journey and yeah. how your share your share structure set up as well what's the what's the worst story i'm really interested in this now what's the worst story you've heard of a, of a founder that's hasn't really looked at the legal structures and then it's all gone wrong what's the worst story that you've heard i mean there's, there's two stories in my head but i think one that got an awful lot of coverage 
was a kettlebell kitchen, which was, you know, basically kettlebell kitchen was this meal prep delivery service. You know, uh, the founder of it nailed her product, which her food was fantastic. She nailed logistics. Um, she was franchising and branching it out. Uh, took some investment from the wrong investor and, you know, ended up, um, you know, they took a company from beneath her and she didn't know all along. And, you know, there's a lot of press out there on it. There's a podcast, you know, two years later, she's finally, finally, um, she's wanted closure from it. I think she's she's released what really happened and all the proof that went with it from emails and et cetera. But I think there's some real tough lessons to be learned in that, right? It's like no one wants to be that founder having a 20 million pound company taken off her, a hugely profitable business with great potential. So I think, um, you know, my message to all founders is just be wary, but you've also got to have, um, you've got to have patience and you've got to have trust. You can't go in there thinking that everyone is going to rob you. Otherwise you will never build a relationship. Um, but you know, it, it's just being cautious is the, is the key message, I think. And you're growing, you're growing this business in um, in the northwest as well, aren't you? I'm really interested in this because you hear a lot of tech news and startups scaling from you know London and and the south primarily. So I'm really interested to, to hear your take on you know being being a founder from the the northwest, but also scaling your business because you decide to stay there as well. So. Yeah, I'm really interested to hear your take on on being a founder from the Northwest and also scaling your business there. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I love Manchester. I'm originally from Liverpool. It, it's just Liverpool hasn't got the invest in, investment scene. And no matter what way you put it, you need investors to make a tech community, right? And you need people to take the risk um, and you need that mentality. And Liverpool doesn't have that yet. It, it's quite a lot of digital software houses um, and agencies on the Baltic Triangle, but Manchester has that. And I think we're attracting, you know, the people that I'm speaking to, um, whether it's Coot Bank or whatever it is, you know, we're attracting extremely high net worth individuals to Manchester right now. Um, you know, there's a lot of Chinese investors. Um, there's a lot of um, Arabic investors uh, across property, across tech. And, you know, we're getting big scale ups who are actually finding that, you know, Manchester is a place where they want to be outside of London, like Depop. Um, Moonpig, Booking.com, Amazon, uh, you know, I think it's because Manchester Airport itself is obviously branching out and doing more long haul flights to different places and being more connected. Um, but I really think, you know, the next kind of five years or so, I think we're already on the map for one of the best cities in Europe and we're, we're going up. Uh, but I really think it's going to grow based on the traction that I'm seeing and how competitive it is to get good talent there. And companies are almost having bid and wars to get to get software developers. So you think the mentality that you just talked about is changing massively where people are looking more, you know, increasingly looking to you know, like Manchester, Liverpool for that tech startup? There's no barrier to entry. Some of the best investors that I know and read the books and listen to the podcasts of, they invest across continents. You know, I've met those people, you know, when they love a founder or they love a team and a problem, it doesn't matter where they're based. Um and I think, you know, we're seeing more of these people, SEIS and EIS create great tax break opportunities for people. So it even becomes less of a risk anyway, that you can't physically go to their office every day if your investment is in another city. But I definitely think, you know, Manchester is, is growing. And, you know, there's, there's so much data around that with Tech Nation and other things. All right. I think we're going to wrap it up there. Um it's been an amazing insight into housemates and to you as a person. Uh, so yeah, massive pleasure to have you on, Lydia. Thank you so much. You know, your questions have been great. Um, and yeah, you know, it's been really good. You know, I love your podcast. I've subscribed and I'll be sharing this episode when it when it goes out across my social networks. And yeah, let's stay in touch. Oh, thanks. Thanks very much. How can people how can people stay in touch with you and also uh, stay in tune with, with housemates in the future? Yeah, so... Um, on LinkedIn, I'm pretty much the same name everywhere. So Lydia Rose Jones on LinkedIn, the same on Twitter and the same on Instagram. I reply to anyone who messages me or tweets to me. Um, I just love speaking to people. So yeah, people can get me there. And for the company, like they can reach out to the company accounts or they can reach out to individual team members accounts, which are all visible as well. Um, 
but yeah we always love hearing from people in this lockdown period i know a lot of people have a lot of free time and i get a lot of messages as to what sort of podcasts and books i recommend so do you have any sort of book or podcast recommendations uh yeah you know there was one i read a lot of books well i read a lot of books and i listen to a lot of audio books and i comprise them together to say that i read a lot a lot of books but i don't really know if that's true um but you know there was <laughs> there was one recently called play bigger um by al ramadan i think it is but what there's like three co-authors on it um and basically it's about like how do you why do, why do some companies take all the category, um, you know, like the Ubers, Facebooks, Googles, um, you know, they call them a category king. How are they formed? Looking back over thousands of data points that's never been done before. You know, these guys who have exited, you know, big billion dollar companies themselves over in Silicon Valley, you know, interviewed founders, interviewed venture capitalists, went through the deal flow um, and just picked upon across all industries, not just tech. Even like uh, Beard's Eye Food, how did Beard's Eye become its category winner? And a category a category king usually owns 70% of its market. And there's loads of valuable lessons in that. Like it's, you don't have to be first to market. The best product doesn't always win. There is some luck in it. Um, but, you know, this book really, really dives deep into how to maximize opportunity, how you could potentially build the next category king. And I think all startup founders you know, we're all on a mission to do that in our own verticals. And then from a, um, from a podcasting basis and a blog basis, um, I listened to uh, Farnham Street. Uh, so it's fs.blog. Um, and I come across that because like loads of the investors out in Silicon Valley, we share it. Um, and it, I can't really explain it. It's a combination of like world leaders, mental models, interviews with some of the best founders um the best investors and i just think it's a really you know it's a, it's like a treasure box when you go on there you can you can spend hours listening to some of the most amazing people about decision making um it feels a bit like that that rival to netflix for like personal development called masterclass it feels like that but without it being as cringy um so i, I think <laughs> have a look at that you know I, I share articles and podcasts of that on my my twitter but yeah i'm always digging for things and i'm always sharing things so i'll put it in the description actually if anyone wants to check it out Great. um so yeah thanks again lydia for joining me and i wish you all the best of luck for housemates i definitely want to invite you on sometime in the future definitely definitely we'll see where we'll get hopefully it'll be the category king Thanks for listening to this episode of the Millennial Entrepreneur Podcast. It really was a pleasure recording with Lydia. It was really interesting and definitely one of my favorite episodes to record. If you did enjoy, please be sure to leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It really does help us out. Share it with your friends. Follow us on Instagram. The link's in the description. And yeah, I'll see you in the next episode.